Y'all ready to get, get, get it going? Yeah, I made it in. You did make it. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, welcome to the specially called July 2022 20, meeting of the City of Tuscaloosa Planning and Zoning Commission. This meeting allows for alternative participation in order to accommodate all citizens. Any written comments sent to staff were forwarded to the commission directly. This time, I introduce our staff, uh, Ashley Kreitz, Executive Director, Mike Garner, Associate City Engineer, Jimbo Woodson, Deputy City Attorney. There are nine members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, all of whom are appointed by the mayor for staggered terms, with the exception of the City Council representative who is appointed by the City Council. I ask the commission members to introduce themselves and state their occupation, uh, beginning with Mr. Rumsey. Uh, Stephen Rumsey, business owner. Okay. Uh, Dina Prince, attorney. Estella Hare, finance. Ann Hornsby, attorney. Eddie Pugh, retired. Bill Wright, business owner. There are sign-up sheets outside for public comment. If you do not sign up, you will still be given an opportunity to speak. Those wishing to comment on the proposed code updates have been uh, have been notified staff in advance of the meeting, and you will be provided the opportunity for remarks during the public comment portion of the agenda. Those participating virtually or written comment have been have notified staff and will be introduced prior to providing comment or having their comments read into the record. The commission will take up items in order of the agenda. The commission will receive a presentation from staff regarding proposed zoning text changes for the articles identified for discussion. The commission will vote to recommend or not recommend these amendments. Note that the Planning and Zoning Commission is a recommending body for zoning text and zoning map changes. The City Council is the final authority. After the staff presentation, the floor will be open for public comment. Individuals wishing to express support or opposition will be given two to three minutes to speak. Only the Planning Zoning Commission can grant a specified time extension to an individual. We will begin with those parties in person tonight, followed by those participating virtually. When it's your turn for comments, staff will introduce you to the Commission to provide your remarks. Those who have provided written comments will have those read into the record, record by staff. Public comment will be received, the floor closed to public comment, and the commission will open discussion among themselves, reserving the opportunity to vote to accept or reject any proposed changes for final consideration at the review meetings that will take place in 2023. These proceedings are video recorded and broadcast live. All in-person comments should be made at the podium into the microphone. Comments made by phone or virtually are video recorded through the conferencing application. Please first state your name and address for the record. Jurisdiction regarding zoning text amendments, sections 11-52-76, the Code of, State of Alabama states, the legislative body of such municip municipality shall provide for the manner in which such regulations and restrictions and the boundaries of such districts shall be determined, established, and enforced from time to time, amended, supplemented, or changed, and may adopt such ordinance as may be necessary to carry into effect and make effective the provisions of this article. The Planning and Zoning Commission serves as a recommended by it to the legislative body. While the zoning text amendments will be considered in pieces, they will not be enforced until the full zoning text is adopted and the zoning map changes implemented. In layman's terms, if there is a vote at any point to recommend changes, they will not be enforced on any property until the City Council adopts the zoning text and zoning map changes formally through many public hearings. At this time, I'll ask, do any members of the commission have any conflicts of interest or possible conflicts for any topics on the agenda for discussion this evening? If so, please state for the record. Having heard none, with that, we will begin. I may have one, but I don't know. <laughs> I just have to see where we go with it. Fair enough. Well, and we aren't, we aren't voting on anything this evening either, Commission, so um, we'll keep that in mind, Mr. Rumsey. Thank you. Uh, Commission, I appreciate y'all this evening, and I know we've got a very light crowd uh, tonight in terms of uh, those of us here in City Hall, so I hope that there are a lot of good folks at home tuning in on Facebook and the City's channel. Um, as always, we like to just remind everybody where we are, what we're doing, what those expectations are. Our steering committee members, please note your role in the process. Planning Commission members, I know that y'all received a draft of this about three weeks ago and you've been able to take a look at it. Um, just remember to 
listen, ask questions uh, when you don't understand uh, a question or something from the public commenters. Um, and for everyone watching at home, these meetings will begin at 5 and end promptly at 7 if they are not done beforehand. Uh, we will utilize a three-minute timer visible to all parties, um, and staff will manage the flow of the meeting for efficiency's sake. Let's recall together that this code rewrite process is an ongoing, uh, ongoing endeavor that will build on itself. Um, we want a code that is going to work or uh, maintain what works today, update what doesn't, make our code more user friendly, um, and implement the recommendations of the comprehensive plan. So this evening, uh, you'll remember that lakeside living future land use character type. Everything we're talking about tonight is supposed to fit into that lakeside living character type. Uh, we're gonna redefine or consolidate some existing zones, add new districts. As you've seen, we have three new districts to discuss tonight. We don't have anything very specific to the lake. Uh, and then we want to update development standards and our permitted uses. Through this process, of course, we are looking first at the text, and it will build on itself with those purpose, intensity, and dimensional standards that we'll be discussing tonight, development standards, and finally, we'll wrap up with use standards at the end of this process before we go to change the colors on our map. Uh, so, of course, we are within the zoning code. We're mostly dealing today in that section four, our zoning districts. Um, and it establishes the more than 30 zoning districts that will regulate land use and development. Um, we are, again, tonight looking at our lake districts, that lake residential, lake multifamily, and lake commercial. So as we jump in this evening, We've got, uh, as feedback from our stakeholder meetings leading up to tonight's meeting, we've got some general feedback uh, to, to have for our notes for all zoning districts, basically, and things that we need to take back to our consultants. Uh, but we wanted to mention to you as well. Um, the first identified piece was that there needs to be some building material standards established for all of the zoning districts, all three of them. Uh, the lake is so special. Um, and having building material standards that are easily applied and the things that we know today um, would be more than appropriate. And you saw within the lake multifamily that call for windows that face the lake, uh, the lakeside, things of that nature to really increase the quality of development around Lake Tuscaloosa. Uh, the second item was to clarify whether the, zone, uh, the zoning districts would apply to land that actually touches and abuts the lake um, or whether it's everything that's designated within that lakeside living character type. Uh, that was a question that came up when we, we gathered the uh, lake subcommittee back up, and it had been a couple years uh, since we'd gotten to visit with that group. Uh, but they wanted to know, is it everything in that character type or not? That's a fair question. We want to clarify that lot width is measured from the front minimum building line and clarify that height is to be measured in stories instead of feet uh, for all three of these zoning districts because of the topography challenges. And then that vegetative buffers need to be examined and adjusted because of topography challenges around the lake as well. Let's talk really quickly about the vegetative buffer concept because you saw that within all three zoning districts. Within the additional standards, uh, we begin to codify the concept of vegetative buffer. Uh, and we say that some minimum vegetative buffer is to be maintained from the acquisition line on all property that adjoins the lake or reservoir. The permanent structures are prohibited within the buffer except for water dependent structures like boathouses, piers, gazebos. Um, of course, chapter 18 is really gonna specify what permanent structures are allowed in the city property on the acquisition side of the lake. Uh, we would allow paths for pedestrians like stairs, golf cart paths, driveways into that buffer, but for the most part, this is supposed to be vegetated. Now, within those stakeholder meetings, um, the, the question came up, and it's a fair question, and I, and I will pose it to y'all this evening. What does buffer mean to you? Uh, because in different parts of the lake, as y'all are familiar, that natural vegetation could be just a rock face 
with a few trees sticking out here and there. Or as you see in the photos, it could be a heavily wooded um, with underbrush in that top photo or in the lower photo, uh, you see a little bit more landscaping, a little bit more manicured uh, aspect of a buffer, but it is still, it's sodded with trees. Um, and so I, we need to discuss what that concept of buffer will mean for this code and for our lakes specifically. We can discuss that later then. Uh, the buffer standards are going to need to be adjusted, as I mentioned, to account for both topography and irregularly shaped lots. Uh, one of the concerns that I have um, in terms of the buffer and codifying buffer is that if you fail to maintain it and you clear cut it, it's just a zoning violation. And when I say it's just a zoning violation, the trees are gone, there are penalty provisions, um, due process means that they can technically go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment and have a uh, request of variance to not have the buffer. Um, but once the buffer is gone, as we've all seen, especially in that lower photo, um, it's going to take years for a landscape buffer to grow back if you want trees. If, if your buffer is trees, then it's going to take years for that to come back. Um, one of the largest things with the buffer situation that you see within the, uh, the alternative development for the single family zone, for the multifamily, is that buffers on severely sloped areas are, are going to start to create a cliff effect, where if you're set too far back from that property line, creating that buffer, you lose any views of the lake, which is part of the reason good that the fly is still here, sorry. Uh, part of the reason that a lot of folks want to be on that lake, it's for those views. Uh, so, Commission, I guess before we get, would you like to talk about buffer now, or would you like to talk about buffer towards the end? I'm interested in buffer now. I'm talking about kind of rethinking a bit. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, one of the things you said is that the zoning violation, what kind of, I mean, I know downtown we have requirements when you do any kind of development, you have certain tree types you can use. Mm -hmm. And I can't recall if there was a minimum height of those. And uh, is that with, something we can, I mean, within a caliper, the, yeah. yeah, within caliper. the university area, we Measure. require a certain caliper tree. Four inch or something? Three, three. Four, three four, at four. least a minimum of three. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, and those do take, I had to plant those back in 11. And it's not a, a larger, but it's taken 10, 11 years to yeah. get larger. I mean, I'm sitting here going, my first thought is it needs to be more of a penalty, I feel like yeah. a better word, for if you clear-cutted that, like in the bottom, if they did that intentionally, I think a zoning violation is a slap on the wrist. And there should be some kind of requirement. Okay, you, you we have minimum requirements. To there can be a penalty process but where they get cited. It's what we do when they cut below the acquisition line. They get a citation and then they have to put back the same uh, amount that they took away. Well, who so determines they, that? I mean, how do you determine that? Is that something you go They back measure what's, what, the, what the stumps are that's left of what was cut, and they have to, if they cut a 12-inch tree, then they put back four three-inch trees. That's what the policy is now? That's how we handle it. Um, but, that, but they get a citation that starts the, the process to enforce them. Have we, to have put, we ever done that? Mm -hmm. About 15 to 20 times. Yeah, we've so done it quite a few who, times. Who enforces that? Lakes, uh, we, yeah, lakes. Lake, they're lake inspectors that, just, that do it, and it goes through municipal court. And so that, that works. But what, Okay, so how long does that take? Just out of curiosity. What's the, I mean, probably about three months before we conclude it. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a way to um, maybe require some sort of inspection during the process of, the, of development to... <clears throat> sort of forestall that. I mean, because once, as you know, as you point out, it's obvious. But once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. So, um, is there a way to prevent that by putting some kind of intermediate step I in the LDP process? It, it w I think it can be repeated in the whatever is put here would be <coughs> repeated in the LDP, so it would cover the entire lake, not just the part that's zoned. Let me ask on, but, the L, on the LDP. I'm sorry, LD, like on the LDP. 
Can who you explain that? that process a little bit? Yeah, yeah. The... explain the LDP right. process. Well, that no. goes... I was going to say, we've got he, he's Mike right here. as yeah. the expert. Yeah, I mean, here we us. are. All right. The public understands <clears throat> it, not we get um, it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's two types, uh, generally, uh, for a subdivision that's going to develop on the lake and can create multiple parcels. There's a, a land development permitting process uh, that is extensive with construction drawings, high, you know, hydraulic calculations, so on and so forth. But when we get down to the to the individual lots that we're looking at here, we have uh, what's called a lakes land development permit. Um, anyone that constructs a house today that touches the acquisition line is required to get that permit. And um, the application form has a checklist of about five or six items that we look for. Uh, we look for the location of the house to make sure that it's, you know, not a, an encroachment on the property. We look for them to provide uh, BMPs, erosion control measures. Um, since there is no sanitary sewer around the lake except uh, in the North River area, um, the drawing has to identify the 300-foot on-site sewage disposal setback boundary line from the lake. It also has to identify where the septic tank and fill line system will be installed outside of that area. Um, so we, we, we get a drawing, an application, and we review it, make sure that it meets that criteria, and then we issue an LDP. Okay, so let me ask you this. So with architectural technology where it is now, can, is there a process they could actually plot the trees that are currently there and then notify us of what they plan to remove and then us have like an approval process on that? Yes, we could. We could add that I as, mean, I just think as that, a criteria. I mean, yeah, that, that puts the onus on whoever's developing the land that they're going to say, "Okay, here's my my current buffer, whatever it may be," and you're required to maintain a certain percentage of that buffer, or be able to commit to the one. You know, some some notification of ones they're they're required to keep. At a minimum, and then and, and whoever's clearing the lands has they can flag them and tag them that hey, this, these guys stay. Yeah, or even a you know, if a tree is larger than X, mm -hmm. then it stays. Something, I mean, something. that would be you know, yeah. that, that, mm -hmm. that's it, that's no problem to draft. Well, and especially the lots adjacent to Lake Tuscaloosa are all required to get an LDP today, so, so we yeah, and we you know, in the process today, we're not analyzing this buffer. Or, or the vegetation is there. Um, the Lakes Division does, a, I think, a very good job of capturing um, violations. There's, there's one ongoing right now. It's my first, my first one to deal with where there were trees cut below the acquisition line. And that, that landowner has been, you know, made aware of this and is in the process of replacing, just like, just like Jimbo said. I think we, one of the... I thought one of the problems is sometimes the house gets built, and then they come in and say, I can't see the lake, and they start cutting the trees maybe six months after the house built because they can't see the lake. Is there some way you could take we, out we the, could do the part a, that says it couldn't be appealed to uh, the Donor Board of Adjustment and that if you cut them, you broke the law? And we'll give them a view corridor so that they can, they can limb up and, and, and take out selective trees so they can see the lake, have a branches, view corridor. Yeah. So they're not blocked off. That would be something we could put in there. But whatever goes in zoning would also go in the LDP. So it would apply in the county as well as um, in the corporate limits. And the, the LDP, that sounds good. I mean, who's presenting? Okay, the LDP. I mean, that's that's to me. Whoever's submitting that is probably going to submit more LDPs in the future because they would be in to their, you know. Professional standard to follow that LDP. These are back before you again. Right? These are some examples of what I think we don't want to see. On right. The lower and if yeah. some, but if somebody wanted to develop the lot next door, they get an LDP. It's yep. determined what has to be left, and they could be if they cut too much, they're going to get a stop work order. They're not going to get a certificate of occupancy. There's a lot of teeth behind it. Okay. If they do it later. After you're three years down the road, yeah. um, then it would be more of a citation, and you got to start planting back. 
right. so right. commission to get us back a little bit onto the zoning side of the house and with the buffer and the land development permit in mind what we need and what we wanted to work through with y'all as well is what does that definition of buffer look like is it maintaining the natural you know the natural vegetation that exists between on that lot between the structure and the lake um, whether it be you know grass or um, the understory or you know the cliff face because if you start removing especially on a cliff face you start removing some of those trees you start to erode what's holding that cliff yeah. together frankly yes yeah, it seems like the trees are really the key right I even, mean even the understory if people want to have a I mean yeah. a flat area you know in the, as a yard that's up above the you know, at right at their house or they have a pool or I don't know what else but um, it, it seems that the, to me that the key is really just sort of maintaining the prior existing trees. But okay. that's just my thought. So, so have you had success make, asking or making them plant on hillsides like this? And we've, our current ordinances only allow us to deal with what's below the acquisition line. You're only talking about 10 explain, or 15 feet. Can you explain, just clarify what the acquisition line is so everybody understands? That's where the city, that's where the city Owns it. It's a pool right. elevation where the city owns. So it depend, depending upon where and the slope and all that, it's usually 10 or 15 exactly. feet of, of somebody's uh, from well, front part of the lot. Why couldn't we make it, you know, further than the acquisition line? I mean, is there a way to say that you can't cut a tree within X feet of you know, more than yeah. 10 or 15 yeah. feet. Yeah, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about. Is, is nothing. That's what we'll be yeah. talking about this evening. You'll yeah. hear, uh, that's, we started this discussion with, you know, you will be hearing a lot about vegetative buffers because mm -hmm. uh, as you saw in the packet that you got, um, you know, the, the Lake Multifamily, I believe, is a 75-foot vegetative buffer. Uh, the Lake Residential is a 50-foot vegetative buffer. And that's above the acquisition line. That's yeah. on private property. Right. So... So one of the things, jumping ahead, is like on some property we have. We if you go if you go around the perimeter, on one end of it, there's a hundred foot rock face cliff. Mm -hmm. And if you went fifty feet up, if you went fifty feet, you would not be on any land where there would be buildings. Just like this, right. not unlike that in a way. Only it's rock. And then as you go around, there's some land that if you went fifty to seventy five feet. Four feet above the acquisition line, it's flat, and you you might you might stop anything from happening on six acres. You might nullify the value of several million dollar lot. Therein lies mm -hmm. the issue there, right? I mean, because you could specifically like on some of those points that are flat, if you get if you went seventy five feet, you could you could literally get well. Let's just say a waterfall where they're selling lots at three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a half acre. If it weren't steep, it could eat up a lot. Mm -hmm. So you got to be careful about condemning someone's property in, in, in a way. Now, mm -hmm. if you're just saying, in other words, if you can't cut a tree, you may not be able to build a house. So that's what you. I say we have right. to be a little careful right. about that. In other words, the topography and the the slope is everything. Yes, and that's and even some of those irregularly shaped lots that have a lot of sloughs just intrinsically built into them, we recognize that, you know, in some instances a 75 foot buffer may completely eliminate the use of a property. And that would be challenging. Yeah, in particular so, on the north end of the lake where it's flat, mm -hmm. 75 feet. You know, well, there are houses that are uh, right. hundred feet. So what I'm hearing from y'all as a commission, and no, of course, tonight is not the be-all, end-all, um, but what I'm hearing from y'all in terms of buffer is the natural ground, the natural ground cover is important. Um, and then we want to maintain existing trees if we can. Yeah. Let me, let me or as many existing trees and as we I can. And I bet there's a formula. I bet, oh, I there's bet, got to I be. I bet there's a formula that based on the... 
this, yes, I agree with that. That the there's got to be a slope, slope words, that we can put in. The number of feet would be altered based on that. <laughs> yeah. And, and mm -hmm. that also goes for things that block other people's view. I agree with that. Like the boat, you know, we talked about that with boathouses. If there's an 80 foot rock wall behind your boathouse and you're not, and the houses have to be built up on the bluff, then it wouldn't matter if someone had a two story boathouse. Right. Because it's all flat like it is on the north end of the lake. You, you may be blocking your neighbor's view. So I think the slope is a big piece of this. Okay. Hey, a sliding before scale. Before we leave this about the citation and everything, is there no way that we can put some monetary, like, it, you know, it, yeah, you got to put the trees back, but for every tree you cut, you know, you'll pay the city a thousand dollars or whatever. I, I don't. I mean, these people that are so that so flagrantly don't follow the rules, they need to be punished. And, and putting in a four caliber tree to replace a 12 caliber tree, in my opinion, is not punishment. Just like you said, Bill, it takes it forever to grow. I mean, we're not, I mean, that's, that's good, but I think, I think we need to look into, is, is there a monetary penalty that they can pay for? I'll make a note of that. I'll make a note. I, I, I agree with Ms. Prince. It seems to me like in the past what I've seen is sometimes we ask for, we ask forgiveness instead of forgiveness uh, permission. Yeah. And sometimes they go in and cut the tree and say, "Well, I didn't mean to." So then now they got the opportunity to go before the zoning uh, board of adjustment. Is that what you said, Jimbo? Yeah, it and would be it? like if if the vegetative buffer is codified. But it looks to me like if they've cut it, they broke the law. It's like saying I did 100 miles an hour, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. We can get together and give you some different options about yeah. what the strongest teeth would be in terms of somebody removing vegetation, uh, either before they get permits or after the fact. Let me ask one last question, and then we'll move on. But this, like, I'm looking at this bottom lot here on the on the right hand side. There is there a, a an appeals process? Say somebody came in and had the wherewithal to want to develop that. He says, you know what, those trees are garbage. I mean. There's some trees that just could be, can they have the ability to say, listen, I'm willing to. With an arborist approval or something yes, along those so I, lines. I, I want, I'm going to take out these 30 trees, but I'm going to plant something that type of city does downtown, requires a certain yeah, I was gonna say, like tree. The HPC, the like Historic Hall Preservation Hall yeah. Commission yeah. does you that. Can, then you can make your lot, you keep it within the tree buffer and in the, in the acquisition and meet the guidelines we're trying to establish here, but give them a chance to make the lot what they want to. I don't see why not. I mean, I just made a note of that. We'll throw that at the consultants and, and see if they can pretty that up into language that could go into right. something. Because you know, you're right. You're exactly right. You know, if you've got a, if you're looking at that lot on the bottom, I can see looking at that, you've got dead trees. You've yeah, got standing dead trees. Dead trees in and spruce looking right pine there. things. And right. I think they'll at least have the ability to do something like that. Yeah. And keeping a standing dead tree around is not ultimate, like, granted, the root ball will hold the ground together, but keeping a standing dead tree around for the sake of keeping a standing dead tree is not accomplishing right. the goals right. of a vegetative buffer. Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, cool. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate that. Yeah, good discussion. Um, all right, so the first, uh, the first zoning district to talk about this evening is Lake Residential. So this is your single-family residential development around Lake Tuscaloosa, um, minimizing surface, area and protecting the water quality of the lake. Um, there is going to be an alternative development option that we'll talk about briefly uh, that would relax the minimum lot width and setback standards and uh, require a little bit of an additional setback from the lake, uh, but would open up uh, a little bit more density allowed within this district for single family. So it's that PUD concept without a PUD as y'all are familiar. Um, you see so many around the lake. So let's take a look at this. For Lake Residential, the minimum lot area you'll see is 20,000 square feet. Minimum lot width is 85 feet. And again, making sure that's at the minimum build line. Um, front setback of 35, side of 10, rear is 35. Your setback off the lake is based on the vegetative buffer that we'll discuss here in a second. Uh, and then building height maximum, of course, um, we're using feet in this table, but again, through those feedback meetings, uh, using stories is going to be far more beneficial in this area. 
Um, what that gives you is about 2.2 dwelling units per acre, and I want you to keep that in the back of your head for a second. Uh, so the alternative development allows for resi residential development with smaller lots <coughs> Uh, arranged to pro provide enhanced open space and protect environmental, recreational, and the aesthetic value of Lake Tuscaloosa. Um, we can put them into this alternative development side of the house uh, if they comply with two standards. One is a minimum of 30% of the land to be open space and a minimum of 150 foot vegetative buffer. Now, in those stakeholder meetings, that 150-foot vegetative buffer was identified as potentially being a bit much, especially based on topography. If you've got a very flat piece of land, that's going to eat up a lot of property versus if you have a severely sloped piece of land, you know, you may not need that much and you've got a cliff. So it is something that we need to take a look at. You kept that 2.2 dwelling units per acre in the back of your mind, for that alternative development for Lake Residential, um, the maximum density per acre has been increased only to two and a half dwelling units per acre. Um, lot area is none, um, and basically what that says is if it's on a septic system, you know, you've just got to follow, as y'all are very familiar as a, as a commission, the septic regulations, uh, which is a minimum of an acre, and you've got to be 300 feet off of um, the septic tank has to be 300 feet off of the acquisition line. Uh, lot widths you'll see there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we made a note through those stakeholder meetings that the density max probably needs to be increased. If we're gonna see folks utilizing uh, this alternative development as opposed to doing a planned development, uh, you probably need to see a little bit more than a 0.3 increase in dwelling units per acre. Um, and so three to four would allow a more moderate increase in density. But that is open for, you know, open for discussion. Well, like uh, the waterfall that I was just mentioning, mm -hmm. they're half acre lots on the lakefront and they, yeah. sold in, they sold out in 14 days. Yeah. And so it's obviously a, so that that that's obviously two units per acre right there. Mm -hmm. So 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 the fact that Crown Point, I'm using those as an example. You know, Crown Point went in with larger lots, mm -hmm. and, just, and then these lots are probably a third or fourth the size, and they sold. So there's definitely a movement towards yes. smaller, less dense land. Uh, I mean, I think that's an indication of where the market is going. I agree. Whereas with people that. used to like big lots, now they like Smaller. smaller lots with I don't even think space. they advertise. I think you, I think they sold them. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah, smaller lots with common space and mm -hmm. absolutely. And plus it makes it more affordable for people. That's one of the problems is the lake, the waterfront so valuable that it cuts out a lot of the people. Mm -hmm. So coming up with some creative ways where people can at least have views of water. Yeah. Is, well, and also so that they don't have to come and ask for a planned unit development also. Yeah. Like, that, that's a benefit after, well, y'all had a quick meeting on Monday. Um, so what do y'all think about increasing that density maximum? There's no I question. That's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. I like to check with y'all. All right, let's move into Lake Multifamily. Uh, so this is land for multifamily residential development near Lake Tuscaloosa. Um, providing vegetative buffer material standards, protecting water quality of the lake. Um, there could be, as we get into uses, there may be some compatible public civic institutional uses that are put into this zone. Um, today, there are two lots adjacent to Lake Tuscaloosa that abut Lake Tuscaloosa that are zoned multifamily. That's it. Um, and they are zoned R4 uh, and RMF1. And so right now, what you see is uh, we're looking at a dwelling unit density of six dwelling units per acre. Uh, lot area minimum of three acres. You see a lot width minimum of 500 feet. Front setback of 35 feet. Sides of 20, rear of 40, lake setback, vegetative buffer standards, and then building height of what would be five stories, actually, not 50 feet. 
Um, we do make a note that that six dwelling units per acre is below the current allowable density. Uh, so today, that property that's zoned R4 uh, has a maximum dwelling unit density per acre of 15. Uh, the one that is RMF1 is, there is actually no prescribed maximum dwelling unit density for that lot. Um, it is just if you can park it, you can make the parking counts work, um, you can build it. Uh, but RMF2 uh, is 22. So uh, there, there's likely a happy medium that exists that may not be six, um, but also isn't 22. Everybody that I speak with says it's all about the design. Mm -hmm. And it's not about the unit count, it's about how it looks. Yeah. Like if you put a, what looks like a Hampton Inn on the, on the lake, and they don't, you know, it's all about how it blends in. It, nobody cares about how many units, it's whether it looks good. What's the name of that thing next to Captain Stamps again we were talking about the other night? Is it Mariner's Cove? You know, there's like five. Yeah, it's been the new development. Yeah, and it was kind of before its time, but nobody even notices it anymore. At the time, it was a big deal. But, five, I mean, so there's five. I don't know how that would. There's probably five units on. Well, it's probably a 15-acre lot, but, but the units are probably on one acre. Right, they're all consolidated in together. Had been one of those for sale in 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. There is a demand, an extraordinary demand. If, if someone could get a product, and it's actually just getting worse because really everything built up to the lake now is, is a million plus. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a way to create a product where, where, where it looks good blends in with nature, blends in with the environment, with building materials, architecture. Legislating taste is very difficult, not impossible, but I think that's where we, where we, where we get into those building materials and architectural standards to the best of our ability. If we can make, you know, if you could have a house that looked like it blended in well, and it, and it, and it was attached, units and you really couldn't tell it, but I don't think people would care. It would just offer the opportunity to buy something that might be less than a doggone million dollars. Yeah. Well, and y'all saw, you had a, a condo development on mm -hmm. Monday night, didn't you? Yeah. What did we rezone that to? I, yeah. I'm admitting that I've already forgotten what we rezoned it to. <laughs> we didn't rezone it. Two days ago. You know, it, was already, it was already zoned? We didn't rezone the, it. The heat we'll take no. about that is I test drove that after the meeting well, and how, asked how somebody what they that? thought. Everybody asked like how many units it was, okay. and everybody said 100. And I said, no, it's 34. Ms. Prince, right. we're, we're going to see that again, by the way. Yeah, I mean, that's only 34 okay. units, but, I mean, everybody thought it was 100. True. It looks like more. True. I, th I think what you want to do is just create a, 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 a framework that people can be creative within. Yes. Right? I, I would As opposed to dictating architectural standards, yes. you want to give them the freedom to be able to, to yeah. use creative. I, I don't see y'all wanting to require everything has a pitched roof, everything has a 612 uh, pitch on it, you know, everything right. is clad in... And you know the Pick a siding. Um, exactly. I don't see y'all doing that. And the thing also, Stephen mentioned earlier, the north part of the lake is totally different than the south part. Of the lake. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean. So you you have almost, to have that flexibility yeah, because yeah. you can't. Right. It's not that you can have a, a north North Lake residential. Right. South, it would look good exactly. Down. That would be. Yeah. Anyway. And, and those some of those structures were built so long ago. We could have a resurgence of redevelopment up there, yeah. maybe in the next. 10 to 20 years. That's obviously that's where it's going to redevelop next. Is yeah. The north. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, North Park. Yeah. Okay. Uh, looking at those additional standards, uh, as we talked about, I, I mentioned that vegetative buffer was going to, to show up and talk about it. So, again, Lake Multifamily says uh, required a 75 foot vegetative buffer from the acquisition line into that private property. Uh, again, permanent structures being prohibited, except water-dependent structures, et cetera. Uh, this is something with topography that we need to relook at and make sure that it is not damaging to properties. Uh, and additionally, for Lake Multifamily, 
uh, we say that building facades facing the lake shall include windows, functional entrances, and balconies, verandas, porches, or other similar architectural features. Um, and so I think in addition to building material standards uh, that you see within the Tuscaloosa Forward Zoning and within the University Residential District and what you'll see in downtown, just maintaining those standards uh, that we like, pushing them forward, you'll see a really nice product along the way. Finally, uh, and this is uh, one of, I, I feel, one of the more exciting districts, uh, is Lake Commercial. And this is a, another brand new thing, but it all came from that lakeside living future, uh, future land use character type. Uh, so this is lake supporting commercial development and marinas. Uh, those development standards, again, are designed to implement the lakeside living character type from that plan. Uh, uses are limited to small scale restaurant, retail and office uses, as well as marinas and other ancillary development. So um, it's a, a very limited commercial type. We're not talking about big box stores. And you'll see that here in a second with that ground floor uh, square foot minimum or maximum, I'm sorry. So as we look at Lake Commercial, uh, you are looking at a lake frontage width. You need 75 feet of shoreline minimum. Um, a front setback of 20 feet, because these are mostly going to be things that are fronting the lake, but will have public access. Um, gross floor area of a non-marina use is going to be 5,000 square feet. So, taking a look at all of that, again, noting lake, uh, the lake commercial height changes to three and a half stories. Um, but Let's stop there for a second. Oh what, yeah. What about uh, is there any kind of parking? If there's yeah, I'm, I'll, we'll get into okay. that in a second. And also, um, so when it comes to parking, know that we will have a meeting down the line where we talk about parking standards based on use. Right. Um, but there are some additional standards for Lake Commercial that have been outlined that we'll go through. Uh, so the Lake Commercial is looking at a 50 foot vegetative buffer. Uh, that pre-existing vegetation shall be maintained to the maximum extent practicable, um, and then existing vegetation would be supplemented to meet any standards of this section, not disturbing vegetation on the lake side of the acquisition line. And then, Mr. Wright, to your questions, all off-street parking areas, waste and recycling storage areas, and ground-based HVAC equipment shall be screened from view from the lake and public street. Uh, using fence or wall and a combination of shrubs and trees. And then additionally, off-street parking spaces provided in excess of the number of parking spaces required. So if you're providing extra parking spaces on your property in addition to what you have to have, remembering that our parking standards are going to change, um, that is going to be done with a pervious surface. We don't want additional asphalt near the lake. We don't want additional runoff on the lake. Uh, so we want to see a pervious surface material um, that would be maintained with uh, regular upkeep, whether that's sweeping, vacuuming, repair of surface damage, whatever else, to make sure it continues to function and does not push additional water into uh, Lake Tuscaloosa. Would, would you, okay, like say you had a restaurant there, what's the, the parking requirement on a restaurant in town? Uh, today, re restaurants are one per 100 square feet, okay. if I remember that correctly. We have the kind of keep the same guidelines that there, or we would be more flexible based on... So our parking standards generally need to change. They're very restrictive. Um, you know, your 1972, 1972 says one parking space per 100 square feet in a restaurant. Tuscaloosa Forward Zoning says one parking space per 300 square feet in a restaurant. Um, and so you start to see that change. Again, we'll find that, that balance. Um, but, you know, for a, a restaurant on Lake Tuscaloosa, you could see uh, people going for a date night on a Friday and they're driving in. Uh, because I think what's really cool about Lake Commercial is it's opening up the lake to not just those folks that live on it. Uh, it's, it's providing opportunities for um, more folks to enjoy this resource that we have while also keeping that lake our water resource, our drinking water resource. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's become a culture. People mm -hmm. don't think about developing even you. Yeah. But we can change that. Yep. 
you've got that opportunity. Um, even, if, even if you weren't waterfront with the places you could develop, just so you could see water. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so like, true. I'm so used to it just being R1 blocks like a blockade. Yep. Well, and honestly, all of this came from the Lake Subcommittee, that steering committee that our, um, or the subcommittee of the broader steering committee through the framework process. Um, but having the opportunity to not only vote in, if you wanted to vote over to a restaurant, um, but to be able to drive into it as well, I think it's just, it's a cool opportunity that this zoning is providing. We'll it's encourage. Not that we haven't had it and hopefully we'll encourage, right? Yes. That, that petition we saw Monday night where they said you have to be, you have to live in the development to go to the mm -hmm. restaurant. I don't think that's really. Um, I think to be successful in the restaurant, I mean, you need all the customers you can get, don't you? Totally agree. I mean, I would be surprised if you could be successful yeah. with just the people who live at North River or whatever in District 1. But, I mean, he said it, not me. <laughs> but I bet he'll it. change it or ask for people. Yeah. Possibly. Does that go in front of the council? Right. Uh, that that that's planned unit, be. yes, yeah, that's, that's a planned unit development. Well, Commission, really quickly, those were those three residential, or not three residential zones, three new zoning districts to talk about. I want to, I'm putting this bug in your ear now uh, because our first discussion about the subdivision regulations will be on December 7th of this year. So a Christmas treat for all of you, if you will. Um, you as the Planning and Zoning Commission are the final authority on your subdivision regulations, as well as their adoption, their amendments, anything like that. You are the final authority. Uh, but the subdivision regulations will have Im implications and impacts on zoning. So we are gonna want these two to kind of walk together. Um, and so we want to talk about our, the first brush with new subdivision regulations and amended subregs will be on December 7th, but from this conversation and from the stakeholder involvement, uh, we may want to start thinking about things uh, like requiring uh, for new subdivisions, whether they're in any of these zones or even uh, outside of the county, requiring public access uh, somehow, some way, so that you don't have a tier one lot necessarily uh, and then everybody else is a tier two because they don't touch the lake and don't have access to it because access to the lake has been blocked off. Mm -hmm. You may want to think about that. Um, and it could be, you know, just public access within that homeowner association, but it's still access to all homeowners within that. Uh, you, we need to start talking and thinking about satellite septic lots and how, uh, and you all have heard me say over the years, um, they do increase density. Now, knowing where the world is, and I, and I sent you that article this morning about uh, how underdeveloped we are when it comes to housing, and I know that it is strange to think about um, workforce housing along the lake, and I don't know that we're necessarily thinking about that, but additional housing anywhere opens up housing in other places that could be for work. So, so one, one consideration that I've always wondered about is the septic tank lot. Mm -hmm. What are you calling it? The, the satellite lots. So does that square footage on that lot go toward the total of the one lot minimum? That's something that we've kind of gone back to. I was going to say, I think where y'all have landed is no. So, so the lot's got to be one acre, and then the satellite lot's a different one. Yes. Okay. I beg to differ that that's, that's not what we've been doing. I, don't, I do not believe that is not where you've landed. That was last no. I checked, that's where we have. Yeah, landed. we've and another thing along with that is it doesn't happen often, but right there at the end of the south end of the lake is where um, there's a point clear road. You know what I'm talking about? Rolling Fuse Development. We have satellite lots on the city sewer tank. And one of the owners had a satellite lot that was sitting basically in the front yard of someone else. And he was going to build a house on it because it was because it, it met the criteria. And it so happened to be in our front yard. <laughs> okay, and so 
we were extorted, so to speak. We had to buy the lot for a lot of money because we didn't have any funds. You may remember the case of this, you know. Um, the satellite lot met minimum standards of a lot. Yep. So they started to build a, what they said was a house for their mother. And we're like, you're kidding. This is the septic tank lot. And we've, and we've, over the years, because I know that y'all started, the Planning Commission, in the time that I was with y'all, um, and, and going forward, y'all have really, you have turned the tide a bit on how you've looked at that, especially when it comes to uh, the final platting of satellite lots, where satellite lots can't be unhooked from the lot that they serve. They are for septic tank use only. Because I remember a case at one point in our lives that they came, they wanted to undo. Uh, they, they brought proof from the health department that there was no septic tank on the lot, and they wanted to plat it as a residential lot. I remember that very distinctly, and I believe that y'all as a commission denied that because it had originally been for that specific property and That's what right. if in it the looks future. Like right. It's, it's an asset. Yeah. Somebody can't build a house, in theory, in your front yard or yeah. your backyard. So that'll be something for y'all as we go forward. We've really got to think about how we want to handle satellite septic lots. And I, and I think the times are changing a little bit. Um, and then whether you want to see something like minimum lake frontage requirements for property. Because remember, what we just discussed, that lake residential, lake multifamily, lake commercial, only applies if that property is within the city limits. Um, and so the subdivision regulations are where the, pro or the lots that are in the county that touch Lake Tuscaloosa, that's where uh, we have that teeth. It's within your subdivision regulations. So just all things to think about as we move forward. And I know that there will be things that we add to this list as we approach December 7th. Um, but just putting that out there as we begin to begin to crank up the heat. Can we go back? <laughs> I wrote something down very early on. We talked about gazebos in there. Mm -hmm. but can you go back to that one area there that mentioned gazebos <laughs> and where they could be or where they couldn't be? Yes, sir. Because I want to know what define a gazebo. I'll, I'll define a gazebo. Okay. <laughs> What yeah, we can, we can define a gazebo. The reason I ask that, there's a lot on the lake that someone has, has built. It looks like a gazebo, but it actually has a bathroom and a bed and a Aww. small little kitchen. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's on a lot that's very, the terrain is very tough. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -mm. There's a, what? It's towards the northern part of the lake, but it's a, a beautiful, it's in a little slough. But it's, it's, I mean, he's kind of built a structure oh yeah and you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah could you get a picture it, of that at some time it, it is gorgeous yeah it's been there a long time it has been there a long time but i'm just i'm trying to decide could someone define that as a gazebo yeah, and then we're in high school. Huh? Yeah, it's been there since we were in high school yeah it's gore i mean it's gorgeous because what i believe they part way up on a hill and have a cart path uh, down to it yes yeah. it's, it's it has a beautiful dock and it's more like a little man cave. I think I sense, actually, in some of the pictures, as I was pulling some of these, I think I've seen it. <laughs> it it's But I think the I agree with you. And I think the definition of gazebo that is intended is the open, well, open air, you know, well, Cinderella we, story gazebo. We have that issue I think with the wedding crashers where he lacked it up. Also that. <laughs> but then we have a, an issue with, didn't the basketball coach want to do something on, a, on his dock? Yes. He did. And he built an accessory structure, which was a boathouse. Right. But the main structure never got built. I just don't want to call it a gazebo. I mean, I agree. I think there needs some fun sure. to find the function of a gazebo and what it can and can't be. That's fair. That's fair. Anyway. All right, Commission. Um, as we wrap up, um, in terms of public comment, I did get one email uh, from Ms. Kelly Fitz. She was very supportive of the vegetative buffer. Um, and um, the ideas that were in it, I let her know. I would let y'all know. So. No, no, Robert Reynolds in there. No, Mr. Reynolds. I was. I know. <laughs> I really thought we'd hear from him. I'm stunned. <laughs> so, so 
someone can reach out. Uh, Commission, do you all have any questions for me? Well, I know we've had it. This has been, it has felt a little bit more casual, but I've, I've appreciated that ability to, to have this dialogue this evening. Um, I think it's been really good. Can we get, can our consultants consult with like, are they, are they official land planners? Yes. So, I mean, like, they're used, they understand the density of like that lease, the new urbanism that we have. Mm -hmm. Tradition, uh, TND development. Yeah. But no, we'll. So when you talk about units per acre, I'm not really familiar with how many that might be. That's fair. And I, um, the flash, like when you mentioned waterfall, I had in my head, I think they may be at like four dwelling units per acre, four and a half possibly for the development as a whole, um, which still feels fine. Yes. I think it's the lakes. I think it may be called no the water. The water. I'm not talking about the lake and stuff like that. Oh. I'm talking about I think it's the water. So I'm talking about it's, it's kind of like a, it's one of these loose urbanism towns like. Randy's truck and Randy yeah. driver or whatever it would be. That's what you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Those, those towns, they built around, they built around water. So mm -hmm. we may want to look because they've gone sky high. And That's true. Something we might be interested in because water is their home. Yeah. Now their topography is probably more like a lake halfway up. It's not true. steep. It's still. They would be a very good. We might, we might learn something about that. We'll make a note of that and send that over to them to take a look at, especially. Commission, we've got, um, as always, I like to tell you what to look forward to. Uh, so, August 17th, we will be looking at downtown districts in the riverfront. Uh, in September, we get into definitions, non conformities. A couple more single-family districts are multi-family districts as well. In October, you've got landscape and buffer standards, off-street parking and loading, lighting standards, some general regs, things like pools, fences, walls, etc. And November 2nd, we will look at planned development districts. And I mentioned to you already, December's meeting is subdivision regulations. So as you can see, we're starting to move out of those dimensional standards. We've got two more meetings on dimensional standards. Um, and then we will get, we'll start getting into that nitty gritty. Um, and so I'll continue to, to send y'all um, what to look at well ahead of the meeting, three weeks or so, I think is what we got this time. I was very pleased with myself, um, but we'll make sure you get it well in advance, stakeholders as well. Um, and as always, I know we've got, um, and I mentioned this to the council yesterday, um, but we're not sacrificing doing it right. Uh, to do it quickly. Uh, and I've appreciated the fact that y'all have been uh, just so diligent through this entire process. It, it does not go unnoticed. So, thank you. That's all I've got for you tonight. Anybody else? <laughs> adjourned. Thank you. Good night.